<laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be uh, speaking at the Lisbon uh, webinar in Analysis and Differential Equations. Uh, obviously, I'm not in Lisbon, but I'm also not too far away. Uh, so this is uh, going to be uh, about some uh, relatively recent joint work with uh, René Kilodran um, on an extremal problem in harmonic analysis. Uh, I would like to start by just presenting three uh, apparently unrelated problems. The first one comes from geometry and it asks for the following. So imagine you have the unit cube, say center at the origin and you uh, in the dimensions and you intersect it with a k-dimensional subspace. Uh, when k is 1, this is just a line. When k is d minus 1, we're talking about a, hyper, a hyperplane going through the origin. The question is, what's the maximal volume of the intersection of the unit cube with such a subspace? Okay, so this is the so-called cube slicing problem and has a rich history in uh, uh, both uh, geometry and analysis. That's the first problem. Second problem comes from probability theory. And um, it asks about uh, uniform random walks. So suppose you start at the origin and at every time step you walk a certain direction. That direction is chosen uniformly from the set of all possible directions on the sphere. Um, and you take a unit step and then you do it again and again and again. You do this, this game in d-dimensional Euclidean space. You do n steps. At the end of the day, uh, there's a probability distribution by symmetry considerations this corresponds to a radial function. And the question is, what's the, uh, what's the closed form expression for, uh, for this radial function? Um, the last problem uh, comes from algebra and has to do with uh, um, uh, the group of rotations. So the group of rotations on uh, Rd. Uh, sorry, I stopped because I got a notification, uh, I guess. Uh, questions will sometimes be asked through the, the chat. I'll try to keep an eye out. Um, okay, I was talking about the... Second, let me just make the wording. I, I forgot to say, so if anyone wants to make a, a... Please keep the microphones off, but if anyone wants to ask a question, just open the mic and ask. Thanks. Oh, even better. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so the last uh, problem has to do with a special orthogonal uh, group, SOD. That's a Lie group, comes with a corresponding Lie algebra, uh, denoted it by FRAC SOD. And the question is, uh, what's the largest proper subalgebra of SOD that you can find? In other words, what's the minimal co-dimension of a proper subalgebra of the special orthogonal Lie algebra? Okay. Um, so these are the, the questions. They are uh, obviously very, very different questions, but each of them made a somewhat natural appearance uh, in the course of the solution to an extremal problem in harmonic analysis, which I'm now going to tell you about. Okay, so this problem has to do with Fourier restriction theory. So let me uh, tell you the basics about Fourier restriction theory. Actually, the first few initial observations are quite elementary. So everybody knows that the uh, Fourier transform of an L1 function is continuous. And because of that, it makes sense to restrict the Fourier transform of an L1 function to any set, in particular to a set of Lebesgue measure zero, like the unit sphere. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, when P is 2, uh, we have Plancherel's theorem that tells us that the uh, Fourier transform of an L2 function is no better than L2. In particular, it doesn't make sense to try to define it point-wise or in some other uh, uh, sense in an arbitrary set, for instance, something of Lebesgue measure 0 like the unit sphere. So the question is what, what happens for intermediate values of P? In other words, given an exponent P between 1 and 2, for which exponents Q do you have an LP to LQ restriction inequality like the one I have on the slide. So on the left hand side, we have integration uh, with respect to surface measure sigma on the unit sphere. Okay, so this is the, uh, I guess, uh, the uh, question that uh, prompts one of the central problems in harmonic analysis. So the so-called restriction conjecture was formulated by Eli Stein in the late 60s and um, gives a set of necessary and sufficient conditions on P and Q, depending on D, for uh, which this uh, restriction inequality is expected to hold. Um, restric restriction conjecture was solved in the plane, so when D is 2, uh, the, uh, the, restriction has been, the restriction conjecture has been confirmed. Um, but uh, despite a lot of uh, effort and spectacular progress, it's still open in higher dimensions. Um, 
the picture is a lot clearer in the particular case when q is 2. If q is 2, then you can compose the restriction operator with its adjoint. And a sort of a sophisticated uh, version of the TT star method allows you to establish the inequality for the largest possible range of exponents when p varies between 1 and this Thomas Stein exponent 2, d plus 1 over d plus 3. Okay, so it's a theorem that the restriction inequality holds for the sphere in this, uh, in this case, and that this range of p is best possible when q is 2. Um, okay, so the Thomas Stein inequality will play an important role in what I want to, to, to tell you today. But before I do that, I should uh, say that the, the setting so far is somewhat artificial, so I chose the unit sphere, but I could uh, as well have decided to talk about an arbitrary, smooth, compact hypersurface of non-vanishing Gaussian curvature. Okay? I could even be more general than that. Uh, so, so, of course, uh, an example of, uh, of such a, a hypersurface would be, for instance, a truncated piece of the paraboloid. But um, both of these words, compact and non-vanishing Gaussian curvature, they can be somewhat relaxed. And if I have some uh, degree of non-vanishing curvature, uh, for instance, the uh, cone uh, high, in high dimensions has many non-vanishing principal curvatures, even if its uh, Gaussian curvature is identically zero. Uh, so for the cone, there is a variant of a, a restriction uh, inequality. And also the word compact, so that both the paraboloid and the cone, they're uh, scale invariant. Uh, and because of that, you can actually extend the restriction inequalities to the full paraboloid and to the full cone, in which case they correspond to the well-known Strickert's inequalities for the Schrodinger and the wave equation, respectively. Okay. Um, so just to tell you that there's a, a, a zoo of possibilities out there, but today I really want to focus on, on the sphere. So this is the risk diagram. Uh, characterizing the boundedness of the uh, restriction operator on the unit sphere. So this, um, I guess, very modest uh, point here just corresponds to the trivial L1 to L infinity restriction estimate. A much more interesting uh, Thomas Stein endpoint uh, already gives you the whole blue region. This is by inter interpolation and compactness. And of course, the holy grail would be to get the restriction uh, conjecture. There's progress, so people are working in into uh, making the, the red region blue, but uh, well, in each dimension there's a different story and a different, a different progress. Um, okay, so this is the situation for the sphere. Um, before uh, I tell you about, uh, about uh, the uh, uh, extremal problem that I, I want to discuss, let me just uh, spend a, a few minutes uh, telling you why any of this should be true. So if you haven't heard about restriction before, you, you're probably convinced that L1 to L infinity does hold, but is not very, uh, very interesting. It's just a triangle inequality. Uh, any other instance of a restriction inequality, not clear why, why such an estimate should hold. Uh, so here's some, some heuristics that go into it. So if I uh, denote by R, this curly R is my restriction uh, operator on the, on the sphere. Uh, it's adjoint R star is the so-called extension operator. So it acts uh, in this way, you take a function F uh, that's a function on the sphere, you integrate it against the Fourier kernel with respect to surface measure on the sphere, okay? Uh, that's the extension operator. Uh, in particular cases when the restriction and the extension operator can be composed, for instance, when Q is two, as I was mentioning in the previous slide, then you can check that uh, this uh, composition acts on a generic function by just convolving it with a Fourier transform of surface measure C. So it becomes of, I mean, convolution operators are, are smoothing. You become interested in knowing what this convolution kernel looks like, sigma hat. So sigma hat, sigma is radial, so sigma hat should be radial as well. So it's enough to study it along a particular direction. That's what I do here. I choose the vertical direction. Lambda is just a, a varying parameter. And sigma hat at that point uh, is given by this oscillatory integral which, uh, well, you can write in local coordinates in this way and then appeal to something like the stationary phase method uh, to check that the phase function has a non-degenerate critical point, actually two of them, one on the North Pole, another on the South Pole, and uh, by invoking the appropriate um, stationary phase uh, estimates, you predict a decay in lambda of minus d minus one, that's the dimension of the ambient space, over two, okay? So for the particular case of the two sphere, uh, what you get is something uh, that uh, looks like this, this picture here. And uh, I mean, it's uh, 
what, what you see in the, the, the picture in red is a radial section of uh, sigma hat, and that uh, decays indeed like lambda to the minus one. Okay, but of course in the uh, case of uh, S two we will be able to say something much more precise. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, the problems that I'm interested in come from the subfield of sharp Fourier restriction theory. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the field in which we take restriction estimates and we ask questions about the value, the exact value of the operator norm, uh, maximizers, uh, the existence of maximizers, uh, characterization if possible, the stability questions and so forth. So uh, focusing on the Thomas Stein uh, inequality on the, uh, on the sphere, that's an L2 to LQ, uh, estimate if I uh, formulate it in the adjoint form. So this is the L2 to LQ extension estimate on the sphere. Uh, it should hold in all dimensions uh, d greater than or equal to two, as long as Q is greater than this uh, Thomas Stein exponent. Okay, since I'm interested in the best value of this constant C, it makes sense to define a functional phi, depending on D and Q, uh, which is just the left-hand side divided by the right-hand side of the inequality I'm interested in. And if you take the soup over all non-zero uh, functions in L2, uh, then you get the optimal constant, okay? Uh, I guess an initial uh, question in this, uh, uh, in this realm uh, is whether the supremum is a maximum. In other words, whether maximizers exist. Okay, so many people have worked on this problem and the existence of maximizers uh, for this uh, functional has been established, for instance, in that non-endpoint case in all dimensions. This was by Fanella. Finally, Vega and Vichilia, almost 10 years ago. And of course, the endpoint cases are more, more subtle, but the lower dimensional cases, so when D is two and Q uh, and D is three, uh, Christian Shaw and then Shaw uh, established the existence of maximizers. In higher dimensions, uh, uh, Rupert Frank, Elliot Lieb and Julian Sabin have uh, a conditional result in this, in this direction, but the actual existence problem remains, uh, remains open. Once you know that maximizers exist, of course, you want to know what, 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 what they are. You would like to characterize them. And uh, a very nice contribution came from uh, Foskey in 2015, who proved that the constant functions are the unique real valued uh, maximizers for this functional, um, uh, I guess, for the L2 to L4 extension inequality on the two sphere. Okay, so for two sphere, the endpoint case, uh, maximizers are completely characterized. Um, with uh, Emmanuel Carneiro, whom I'm not sure uh, is in the audience or not, if he's, hi, Emmanuel. Um, we were able to uh, extend this uh, paradigm um, to um, higher dimensions, so still focusing on the L2 to L4 uh, extension inequality on, uh, on the sphere, uh, we showed a similar result uh, in dimensions four, five, six, and seven, and we hit a roadblock in dimension eight. Okay, there's a genuine new difficulty that arises there. Um, and uh, uh, th this was pretty much the, uh, the, the state of the art on, uh, on this problem up until recently. Uh, in particular, uh, other exponents, uh, uh, different from four and I guess infinity, which again is uh, trivial for, for different reasons, um, have not been, uh, been considered. And so the theorem that I want to tell you about today, uh, joint work with Kilodran, um, extends this uh, uh, result to uh, arbitrary even integers, um, uh, still in the setting of these uh, low dimensional spheres. Okay, so the result is what you would expect it to be. Constant functions are the unique real valued maximizers of the corresponding function. Um, I guess I want to give you uh, an idea. So one of the uh, nice things is that many, many different ingredients come into play. And to give you an idea of um, what these ingredients are, uh, I'm going to focus on a special case, and that's the special case D equals three and Q equals six. So in other words, I'm interested in telling you why constant functions are the unique real valued maximizers for the uh, extension for the L2 to L6 extension inequality on the two sphere. And because of that, I can simplify notation and drop this uh, dimensional index from both the functional and the optimal constant. Okay, so the plan is to uh, 
tell you some ingredients that go into the proof of this theorem, in the particular case when d is 3 and q is 6. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so the first step, yes, it's not very surprising, it comes from the calculus of variations. Um, so uh, we know uh, that this functional that we are uh, studying, uh, phi 6, we know that maximizers for phi 6 exist, and so let f be a maximizer, and of course we lose no generality in normalizing it in L2, uh, so that it has L2 norm equal to 1. Uh, now I'm denoting the extension operator by E, this is what I used to call R star, we already know that adjoint of the restriction operator is the extension operator, in which case uh, E star R uh, is the restriction operator. Okay, so I, I would like to say something about the operator norm of E from L2 to L6. Well, since F is a maximizer, this operator norm equals the L6 norm of EF, uh, always raised to the appropriate power. I'm going to write this uh, uh, L6 norm uh, as a pairing between EF and something else, only because I want to use duality and uh, transport E to the other side, which of course picks up a star, okay? Uh, why do I do that? Well, I do that to place myself in uh, L2 so that I can apply the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Of course, you would expect two uh, uh, factors to come up on the right-hand side, but uh, let me remind you that the L2 norm of F is one, so it's not there. Um, well, E is a bounded operator from L2 to L6, so E star is a bounded operator from L6 prime to L2. So here I'm just applying the uh, fact that E star is bounded, um, at which point I can, uh, well, I can rewrite this L6 fifths norm in this more pleasant uh, looking way. Um, and uh, again, use the fact that F is a maximizer for E together with the fact that the operator norms of E and E star are the same, okay? So this is all that goes into this last estimate. So what do we get? We get a chain of inequalities the first and the last term of the chain of inequalities are the same, which means that all inequalities are actually equalities. In particular, when we apply the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, uh, we should have gotten equality, uh, and uh, the cases of equality in Cauchy-Schwartz are well known. It means that uh, one function is necessarily a multiple of the other, uh, which is, I guess, a cheap way to derive the Euler-Lagrange equation for this variational problem. Okay, so what I have here is just rewriting the fact that the two functions to which I apply Cauchy-Schwartz are actually multiples of each other, just recalling the definition of E and E star. Um, okay, so now, um, this is an equation that uh, can be uh, studied from a, a number of different uh, viewpoints. Here it's, um, uh, I guess, for the first time I'm uh, observing that the uh, uh, role of even integers is very special. And it already appears here when uh, it allows me to rewrite this equation in convolution terms, okay? So since four is an even integer, I can rewrite uh, this uh, non-local uh, um, oscillatory restricted uh, uh, identity in convolution terms. And the Euler-Lagrange equation just tells me that uh, the restriction to the sphere of a five-fold convolution of f and f star. I didn't tell you what f star is, but here it is. So f star is just a conjugate reflection of, uh, of f, and it shows up because, well, you have uh, complex conjugates in the original uh, Euler-Lagrange equation, so that just accounts for it. Uh, so the Euler-Lagrange uh, equation is telling me that the restriction uh, of this five-fold convolution to the two-sphere is a multiple of f, okay? So of course, convolution operators are smoothing, and with a bit of work, bit is relative, you can use this to show that any L2 solution of the Euler-Lagrange equation is actually C infinity smooth, okay? Uh, and uh, of course, it's essential that we were able to reformulate the Euler-Lagrange equation in uh, convolution terms in order to, uh, to obtain this, uh, uh, this, this result. So my, my point in today's talk is not to uh, enter the specifics of, um, of this uh, more technical uh, result, but at some point, I will need to invoke some smoothness of uh, maximizers of the Thomas-Stein inequality 
well, maximizers are necessarily critical points or solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equation. And uh, since we were able to rewrite it in convolution terms, we know that they are C infinitesimal. Okay, so that was step one. Step two is a lot easier, but also quite important. So it's a symmetrization step. And there are two kinds of symmetrizations that we can perform. The first one, again, using the evenness of the Lebesgue exponent in a crucial way, tells me that without loss of generality, I can restrict attention to, um, I can restrict attention to non-negative functions. Um, so in order to do that, uh, I can take the left-hand side of the thomas stein inequality and uh, remember it involved the L6 norm of some f-sigma hat and I can rewrite it in convolution terms, at which point this inequality becomes uh, almost immediate. Uh, as a matter of fact, a stronger inequality holds. Um, you get the same thing point-wise, okay? So you can replace f by the absolute value of f and you will get a pointwise inequality that immediately translates into an L2 uh, inequality. Uh, so this is a, a step that uh, we wouldn't know how to perform if Q were not an even integer. The second source of uh, symmetrization comes from uh, antipodal uh, symmetry. And interestingly enough, this step could be adapted if we had a nice application for it, uh, also to the cases of uh, possibly non-even uh, Lebesgue exponents. Okay, so in order to describe this, the, the, this step, let me define an auxiliary function. So uh, give me a function f. I already told you that f star is this conjugate reflection. And uh, I can consider uh, f sharp to be the antipodally symmetrized version of f. And of course, I chose uh, quantities in such a way as to preserve the L2 norm. Uh, so the next observation is that the left-hand side of the thomas stein inequality goes up, or at least does not go down, if f is replaced by this antipodally symmetrized version. Okay, uh, so um, uh, I guess in this very particular case when q is six, uh, this is just a consequence of, um, I guess, a tricky application of the uh, inequality between arithmetic and the geometric means. Uh, in, in general, the, the proof is uh, a bit harder, but can, can be done also for non-even exponents. Uh, okay, so after all of these uh, uh, reductions, uh, when we look at the uh, optimal constant, uh, first of all, we have a maximum here, and we can restrict attention to non-negative functions, which are antipodally symmetric and C infinity smooth. Okay, this was the, the result, of the first two steps. Um, the third step, I uh, guess, relies on some ingredients from uh, operator theory. And this is when we start to explore some of the compactness inherent uh, in this um, inherent to this problem, uh, which of course is uh, something important to uh, to explore if we want to say something about about the maximizers. Um, okay, so you give me a function f in L two of the sphere, and I ask you to consider the following operator. So this is operator t sub f, which acts on a function g in L two of the sphere by convolving it with a certain kernel. The kernel is k uh, sub f, which is given equivalently as the inverse Fourier transform of the fourth power of uh, f sigma hat, or again, because four is an even integer, this fourfold convolution of some f's and some uh, f stars. Uh, why uh, do I care? Why do I uh, consider this operator? Why is it natural? Well, it turns out that the Euler-Lagrange equation from a few slides ago is precisely the eigenvalue problem for t sub f. Okay, so it's just a way of uh, rephrasing things. But uh, of course, it's uh, natural to try to explore, to understand this operator T sub F from the functional analytic point of view. Uh, and so uh, I'll just list some elementary properties of the kernel K sub F and see how that translates into properties of the operator T sub F. Um, okay, so first of all, KF, uh, at zero attains a finite value, so it's just uh, the fourth power of the L4 norm of F sigma hat. And uh, well, this is finite as long as F is in L2 because of the endpoint Thomas Stein inequality. Remember, in three dimensions is L2 to L4. 
Uh, moreover, Kf is conjugate symmetric. Uh, this is just a reflection of the fact that as many stars as non-stars appear in this four fourfold convolution that uh, defines the, the kernel. And uh, finally, an easy application of something cheap like the riemann lebesgue lemma um, allows you to check that the case of F defines a bounded and continuous function on the whole of R3. Okay, so these are properties of the kernel. What do they say in terms of the operator? Well, the operator T sub F is then self-adjoint and positive definite. Uh, self-adjointness is an immediate consequence of these uh, properties of the kernel. Uh, positive definiteness, uh, you might need something like the identity principle for analytic functions on, uh, on RD. Um, where do analytic functions come, come from? This might, might seem uh, a bit unmotivated. Well, notice that F sigma is a compactly supported distribution and uh, as such F sigma hat is uh, real analytic. Uh, the operator T sub F is compact. As a matter of fact, it's Hilbert Schmidt. And uh, a way to uh, check this is uh, just to define this companion kernel. I called it Kf flat. Um, it's uh, in L2 of the, uh, of the product space. Um, and as a matter of fact, the operator T sub F is more than Hilbert Schmidt, is actually trace class. Um, I guess uh, the easiest way to see this is to invoke one uh, of the classical consequences of the spectral theorem for self-adjoint compact operators, namely Mercer's uh, theorem. So Mercer's theorem uh, even gives us an expression for the trace of T sub F in terms of the integral of this companion kernel over the diagonal. Okay, and that this is a finite quantity follows from the properties that we already observed about the kernel. Okay, so the takeaway take message from this, uh, from this slide is that uh, given uh, a function f in L2, I'm able to uh, construct an operator, a uh, trace class, self-adjoint positive definite operator, um, the eigenvalue problem for which is equivalent to the Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay. Uh, now it's, I guess, time to uh, talk a bit about the symmetries of the problem. So the whole action is happening on the sphere. The group of symmetries of the sphere is the orthogonal group. If we look at the uh, subgroup of uh, um, I guess orthogonal matrices of determinant one, we have SO3. Uh, that comes with a Lie algebra, and it's a fact that the exponential map from the Lie algebra to the Lie group happens to be surjective, which means that uh, I can, uh, well, for every rotation, I have an infinitesimal uh, generator. Uh, that uh, will play a role in the lemma that I want to uh, present. Well, before, before I do that, I should say that um, um, there are uh, a number of operations that uh, do not interfere with a functional. Namely, if I have a function f, I might, uh, well, f lives on the sphere, remember, so I can rotate f, and that's not going to change uh, the value of the functional. I can also multiply the function f by a character, and that's also not going to change the value of the, uh, of the function. Um, ah, right, so one thing I need, I need to define is, um, well, if you give me uh, a matrix A in this Lie algebra SO3, so that's just a, a skew symmetric matrix, I can try to differentiate F along A. So I'm calling this the A derivative of F, and that just measures the rate of change of F infinitesimally when you uh, rotate it. Uh, so the first lemma, I call it new from old because this is a way uh, to get new eigenfunctions from given eigenfunctions. Uh, so let's assume that uh, an eigenfunction for T sub F is given. So let uh, F be a non-constant real valued function. Uh, we are okay to assume that that function is antipodally symmetric and has some smoothness for this proof to work. C1 is enough, but uh, we already know that we can uh, get away with C infinity. And let's normalize it in L2. Uh, so further assume that F is an eigenfunction of um, uh, the operator T sub F, uh, equivalently it satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equation for some, for some lambda. Then, this lemma allows us to uh, construct further eigenfunctions for T sub F, namely um, any A derivative of F, whenever A is a matrix in the Lie algebra SO3, that's going to be an eigenfunction for T sub F, 
not with eigenvalue lambda, that would be too much to ask for, but with eigenvalue lambda over five. Uh, same thing uh, when you multiply f by uh, one of the coordinate uh, functions. So here, I just, yeah, I'm just i looking at uh, omega, a uh, point on the two sphere with coordinates omega one, omega two, omega three. Uh, so if I multiply f by omega j for some j between one and three, I get another eigen, uh, eigenfunction for t sub f, again, with eigenvalue lambda over five. So these identities are not hard, it just boils down to noticing these symmetries from above, that if you can, you can rotate f or multiply it by a character, and you will still have a solution to the Euler-Lagrange equation, which you can di then differentiate with respect to the appropriate parameter. Okay, so what's uh, key in this uh, lemma is somehow to uh, find the maximal number of linearly independent new eigenfunctions that uh, we, we, we can find. And that's the second part of the lemma uh, that basically tells you you can find, you can find five linearly independent uh, eigenfunctions, each with eigenvalue lambda over five. And uh, that's going to be uh, crucial later on. So this second part of the lemma uh, is proved by obs observing that the co-dimension, well, in some sense, by solving the algebra problem that I gave you in the uh, first slide, uh, when d equals three. Uh, so the observation is that the co-dimension of a proper non-trivial subalgebra of SO3 is equal to two, and maybe it's easier to think uh, in terms of Lie groups. So um, SO2 has just one degree of freedom. SO3, you can parameterize it by three Euler angles. Three minus one is two. And that's the answer to the, uh, the algebra question from the first, from the first slide. And what uh, makes it possible to locate these two linearly independent matrices A and B in SO3 so that this set is linearly independent. Okay, so again, takeaway message from this slide. If you give me one uh, eigenfunction uh, with a certain eigenvalue, I can construct five further linearly independent eigenfunctions, each with eigenvalue lambda over five. All right, so the last step, or at least the last ingredient that I need before uh, making all of this come, come together, comes from probability theory. Um, so let us consider three IID random variables, x1, x2, and x3, uh, taking values uh, on the sphere with uniform distribution. Uh, I'm going to construct a new uh, random variable. I'm calling it y3. That's just the sum of x1, x2, and x3. This is by definition the uniform three-step random walk in R3, and I hope that I've already conveyed some of the intuition behind, uh, behind this object. And of course, random walks have been studied by uh, probability theorists in, for, for, for a long time. So uh, uh, at first I should say that there's a nice connection between the probability density of uh, the length of Y3 and the threefold convolution of surface measure on the sphere. They're basically multiples of each other modulo uh, powers of r. Uh, you can check this just by a Fubini's theorem, some easy uh, integration in polar coordinates. And, and of course, uh, exp it's not, uh, I guess, surprising that uh, explicit expressions for p3 uh, are, have been known for, for a long time, so we can use them to say something about, uh, about threefold convolutions. So in the case of the two sphere, what I have here are two plots. On the left, I have the plot of the radial section. So all of these are radial functions. I'm just looking at the radial section of sigma convolved with itself three times. It's a function supported on the ball of radius three. Happens to be constant inside the unit ball. And then it decays like one over x until it vanishes at uh, r equals three. Uh, the two-fold convolution, sigma convolved with sigma, have it in red on the right. And, uh, well, that's a more singular object. It happens to blow up at the origin, like one over x, and it also fails to be continuous at the boundary. So it's supported on the ball of radius two and uh, has a discontinuity there. In any case, explicit expressions are known, just uh, showing you a cartoon. And uh, we care about them because we want to say something about the value of these functionals, so phi four, and phi six at the constant function. Well, there are some numbers. I don't really care about the precise powers of pi that show up. What I care is about the ratio between these two, these two quantities. So um, phi six and phi four differ by a factor of two pi. That's what I'm going to need in the next slide. So I kindly ask you to bear that in, in mind. Um, I guess this is what I wanted to say about step five, and now it's time to put it all together, okay? So recall 
that our goal is to show that constant functions are the unique real valued extremizers for the L2 to L6 adjoint restriction inequality on the two sphere. Uh, so it will be enough to show that any non-constant critical point, um, let's say real valued C1, um, well, it suffices to show that any non-constant critical point is not a maximizer, right? Because the maximizers are supposed to be the, uh, the constant functions. Um, okay, because of our previous discussion, we uh, are okay to assume that F is antipodally symmetric and L2 normalized. F is a critical point, so it satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equation, or equivalently this eigenvalue problem for T sub F. Uh, of course, lambda is not an arbitrary quantity, it's dictated by F, and in order to check uh, what lambda is as a function of F, you can just multiply both sides of this uh, Euler-Lagrange equation by F bar, and then integrate, okay? And so you check that lambda is actually the value of the functional phi six at F. We want to, sus uh, to say something about uh, phi six at, uh, 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 at F, so uh, this just tells us it's lambda. We can creatively write lambda as lambda plus lambda over two, and even more creatively write lambda as five times lambda over five, and why do I do that? Well, I do that because um, both lambda and five appearances of lambda over five is something that I already know is in the trace of TF. Why is that? Well, this is because of the five further eigenfunctions that we were able to locate, each with eigenvalue lambda over five. Moreover, this inequality here is strict uh, because TF is a positive definite uh, operator. Okay, so uh, it's part of uh, what the trace of TF entails, but not the whole story. Uh, I guess from a few slides uh, ago, uh, we know how to express the trace uh, in terms of uh, an integral of this uh, companion kernel. Uh, remember that this kernel was just KF at omega minus omega, which is zero. Okay, so I, I think I already said this. So the strict inequality is a consequence of lemma one about new eigenfunctions from old ones together with the fact that all eigenvalues of TF are strictly positive. Okay, so the strict inequality is going to be important for uniqueness. Um, okay, so uh, picking up where we left it, uh, KF at zero, uh, one of, uh, I guess the first property of KF was that this value is just uh, the L4 norm of F sigma hat, raised to the fourth power. Well, but since F is L2 normalized, this is precisely the value of the function of phi four of F. And now it's time to invoke Foskey's result. Okay, so Foskey tells us uh, that the uh, endpoint Thomas Stein uh, L2 to L4 extension inequality is maximized by constants. Uh, F is not a constant, uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, less than or equal to uh, sign here. Okay, so the latter inequality follows from Foskey's result. Uh, from the last slide, so the one bit from the last slide that I uh, asked you to remember, uh, we have this ratio between the functionals phi four and phi six acting on the constant function. The ratio is two pi. And so we can just read the first chain of inequalities, multiply the second chain of inequalities by two pi, and use this information in the box to conclude what we wanted. Okay. So I guess this concludes the proof, and this is why um, constant functions are the unique real valued uh, maximizers for the L2 to L6 extension inequality on the two sphere. Uh, I guess um, I still have some time. So um, th this would be a good time for questions if anyone has one. Um, if not, uh, I think I will spend some time telling you two things. First, how to extend this uh, uh, result to other even exponents, still in dimension three. And then if I have time at the end, I will tell you what happens in the higher dimensions. Okay, so extension to all even exponents. We did q equals six, let's now take care of q equals eight, 10, 12, and so forth. Um, so the good news is that the proof that I showed you seems to mostly uh, carry through with a small hiccup at the end. So the very last identity we needed, this identity in the box here, um, was a precise identity that worked just beautifully. 
Uh, of course, an identity is not necessary there. If we have an inequality pointing in the right direction, we'll also uh, uh, get, get, get the result. And well, if you do the, uh, uh, the, the computations, you check that this is the uh, inequality that you need uh, in order to, uh, for, for, uh, to, to be able to close the proof. And this is something that uh, can, can be checked in a, a number of ways. Uh, so one, one possibility is to look at this functional. Remember that it uh, was the left-hand side of the Thomas Stein inequality divided by the right-hand side. And the original Thomas Stein inequality doesn't have convolution, has a, a Fourier transform there. So this is the first time in which it's actually convenient to look at the Fourier uh, analytic reformulation of, of this uh, functional phi uh, sub, sub q. Um, and this is especially nice because in uh, three dimensions, so the two sphere has a Fourier transform that's just a multiple of the sinc function. So we can rewrite this inequality in the box, the thing that we want to prove. Um, in, uh, well, as an inequality between uh, integrals, uh, if you want weighted integrals of the sinc function. Uh, and, uh, well, the problem becomes quite, quite tractable. Uh, you might try to look for lower and upper bounds for the sinc function and uh, uh, conveniently insert them and get the result. This was, as a matter of fact, the path that Keith Ball, uh, almost 25 years ago, followed in his uh, investigations of the tube slicing problem. So here's uh, Ball's result. So you consider the unit cube, I already uh, mentioned this, and uh, consider the, the case in which you're intersecting it with a linear subspace of co-dimension one. So a hyperplane going through the origin, and you're asking yourself, uh, well, how, how large and how small can that intersection be? Ball's result says that the D minus one dimensional volume of H intersect the Q is at least one and at most square root of two. And both of these results are sharp. So it's one if and only if H happens to be parallel to the D minus one dimensional faces of the cube and square root of two if and only if uh, the, hyper, uh, the hyperplane H happens to contain a D minus two dimensional face of the cube. And key to Ball's analysis, the, the crucial uh, bit in, in his analysis was the following inequality. So this is an inequality for the LP norm of the sinc function. Um, this inequality holds for every p greater than or equal to 2, and it's an equality precisely when p is 2, okay? Um, and, uh, well, if you look back at our problem, it's not exactly uh, uh, powers of the sinc function that we need to, uh, to estimate, but uh, adapting uh, some of his uh, ideas, we were able to establish the inequality in the box and get the result for all even exponents. Um, what about higher dimensions? Well, in higher dimensions, things are more complicated because not just one, but three things from the proof I showed you need some sort of uh, tailoring. The first thing comes from the Li theory step. Uh, so of course, the fact that uh, we were able to find maximal subalgebras of SO3 of dimension two was very helpful. Um, once you know that fact, you might uh, maybe somewhat uh, naively conjecture that the minimal co-dimension of a proper subalgebra of SOP uh, should always be D minus one. Well, that's almost always correct. Happens to fail when D is four. Uh, otherwise, it's true. Uh, so the, the, uh, when D is four, um, uh, I guess the situation is a bit different because for instance, SO4 is the only uh, Lie group out of this uh, list, which is not simple. And I've tried to research a bit uh, into this. Apparently this accounts for some of the exotic uh, aspects of uh, geometry of four manifolds. In particular, it uh, tells you why quaternions exist in dimension four, but uh, uh, not, uh, not otherwise and so forth. In any case, this is not great news. I mean, we will have to account, if we want to uh, prove this result in dimension four as well, we will have to survive with one less uh, eigenfunction. Uh, uh, of a certain uh, of a certain multiplicity, uh, but that, that 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 can be accounted for, and I will say uh, in a minute why. Uh, second difficulty that uh, arises uh, is that uh, well, the previous proofs were uh, based on explicit formulae for the probability distribution of uh, an n-step uniform random walk in R D. We were using n equals three and d equals three. Um, general uh, formulae were 
first of all, only recently obtained for general n, but only for odd values of, uh, of d. And one way to see why this distinction between odd and even dimensions uh, is, is pertinent <clears throat> comes from the explicit formula for the twofold convolution. So when n is two, uh, there's an explicit formula for the twofold convolution that's valid in all dimensions. Here it is. So this is a radial function supported on the interval zero to two. There's a dimensional uh, constant that we don't really care about, one over r, and then something that vanishes when d is three, and that's why we didn't see it beforehand. Uh, in any case, you notice that when d is odd, then d minus three over two is an integer, and therefore you have a polynomial here, which is much, much easier to analyze than the case when d is even, um, d minus three over two is odd, and uh, complications arise. In any case, for two-fold convolutions, things are fine. For three-fold convolutions, things are also pretty interesting. So what I have here is the plot of the, I guess, the three-fold convolution uh, with this uh, sort of harmless radial uh, factor here, r to the d minus one, here just to clarify the picture. And I'm only including uh, pictures in odd dimensions, d equals three, five, seven, and nine. Uh, for these, there are explicit formulas. One of the nice things that you see from the, the picture is that some sort of concentration seems to be happening. Um, and this is uh, also easy to explain in the following terms. So uh, we're taking three step uniform random walks. So n is three. Um, when the number of steps in your random walk is small uh, com in comparison to the dimension, that means that the probability that the uniform random walk, say in three steps, uh, will be performed via mutually orthogonal directions is pretty high, which means that uh, on average, you'll be pretty close to doing a three-step random walk that just takes you from one side to the other of, uh, uh, of a 3D cube, uh, meaning the uh, distance between the end point of your uniform random walk and the initial point uh, will just correspond to a, a spatial diagonal. Uh, if the cube you started from is a unit cube, that spatial diagonal has a uh, length square root of uh, three, and that's precisely the point at which these uh, probability distributions seem to be uh, concentrating at. Uh, okay, but this was a, a side comment. Uh, I still want to tell you about uh, the last stumbling block, which not surprisingly has to do with the very last uh, inequality that we have in the box. Uh, so if, we, uh, if you uh, check precisely what that should be uh, for general D and Q, uh, you get this, this inequality here. So there's a Kronecker delta that's only non-zero when D is four, precisely because of the exotic behavior of dimension four that we've seen from, from before. But this is something that you can try to, to check. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that uh, sigma hat uh, is no longer a harmless multiple of the sink function. Uh, well. It, Formulas are known, but they involve Bessel functions, and Bessel functions are not um, are, are not elementary functions in general. And as a matter of fact, in all uh, even dimensions, they, they they will fail to be uh, to be elementary functions. And anyways, you can try your luck and rewrite this uh, this inequality in terms of uh, weighted integrals of Bessel functions. And uh, well, this is something that. Uh, uh, might not be very pleasant, but at least a computer can tell you something, something about it. So uh, in this slide, I'm just going to uh, show you what the computer uh, has told us. So I'm just rewriting things uh, in such a way, I'm defining these quantities E of D comma Q um, uh, in such a way that the previous inequality holds if and only if these quantities are non-negative. And here's a table of values, so different dimensions. D varies from 2 to 11, and Q is 4, 6, 8, all the way up to 20. And you see several things. So first of all, when D is 2 and Q is 4, this entry here does not make sense because, uh, well, there's no L2 to L4 Thomas Stein inequality on the circle. Okay, on the circle, the action starts at Q equals 6. So this, this entry here is, uh, is nonsense. Uh, when D is 3 and Q is 4, uh, you detect a numerical 0 here. Well, this numerical 0 is an actual 0. This was the identity that we have in the box with this 2 pi uh, for the, the ratio of the operator nodes. Uh, black entries on this table are good news. That means that uh, uh, th these uh, uh, numbers have the right sign. And you see that problems start to arise in dimension 8 and higher. This is one of the reasons why our proof uh, doesn't extend to, to dimensions uh, higher than eight. 
Um, I guess I'm uh, probably out of time. So uh, I'll just tell you that a natural question is that the, I've been telling you about real valued maximizers. You can ask me, what about complex valued maximizers? So we have further results along this direction. They basically tell you that once you know real valued extremizers, complex valued extremizers are easy to characterize. They are basically a complex multiple of a character times a non-negative antipodally symmetric maximizer. Of course, you, you withdraw the obvious conclusions. And since I don't have much time, I guess I will just leave you with a list of six open problems. And I'm happy to give more details if anyone is interested. Thank you very much.